Let's now talk about sinusoidal voltages and currents. The elements in the circuit, resistors, inductors, capacitors, what they do is they apply basic operations on currents and on, and on voltages. Let's see. A resistor multiplies by R, like that, takes a current. Well, you can say divides a voltage by R. It's the same thing. An inductor differentiates like this, differentiates a current, right? And the capacitor integrates a current like so. Or vice versa, you can, you can talk about voltages and then the resistor divides and the inductor integrates and so on and so forth. But the point is that if you put any voltage or current in a circuit, you're going to end for sure with um, all uh, its derivatives and integrals, all right? So unless you want a real mess of time signals of different shapes in the power network, we better choose one voltage with a shape so that its derivatives and integrals, they look exactly like it. It has the same shape when differentiated and the same shape when integrated as well. Of course, the sine wave is a very good candidate. Mm -hmm. So we take a voltage like this with a maximum or peak value of Vmax, amplitude in volts or amps if that were a current, of course. Mm -hmm. We have the angular frequency in radians per second and the phase shift in radians. In radians only, all right, or the equation doesn't make sense. The angular frequency can be written as 2 pi f with f in hertz, and you are familiar with that notation. Charles Proteus Steinmetz proposed to represent a sinusoidal time wave a voltage or a current by a complex number this way. Let's say that voltage has an RMS value VRMS, a frequency omega, and a phase shift theta, like so. He said, let's represent that voltage with this complex number in polar form, RMS value, and angle. So I, I emphasize RMS value and angle, not peak value as in some books of circuits used in second year, excuse me. So the IEEE standard for phasers requires that you have here the RMS value and that is what industry uses. Why? Why did Charles come up with such an idea representing a sinusoidal current or a sinusoidal voltage with a complex number. And when I say sinusoidal, it could be cosinusoidal. But please, if you want to write cosines, make all voltages and all currents cosines. If you want to write them sines, all of them have to be sines. So there is only a phase shift of 90 degrees one way or the other, but you know that. Why? Why did he choose to represent sinusoidal function of times with complex numbers because they are easier to add. That's all. Check them out. You have that voltage with an RMS value of 100 volts and uh, a phase shift of 30 degrees like so. Observe that I have to write the phase shift in radians like this, but I like degrees. All engineers do, so I write that. 30 pi over 180. I know this is 30 degrees of phase shift. So, and I have another voltage with an RMS value of 70 and a phase shift of negative 15 degrees and the third voltage with an RMS value of 90 and a phase shift of positive 45 degrees. I want to add them together. Then I represent them as phasers the way Proteus said. RMS value and phase shift 100 with 30 degrees and 70 with negative 15 degrees and 90 with an angle of 45 degrees. I add them together. How? Well, 100 with 30 degrees, enter. 70 with negative 15 degrees, enter. 90 with an angle of 45 degrees, add 
and the result has an effective value of 237.88 volts and a phase shift of 23.68 degrees and I write that as sinusoidal function of time like this. The addition of those three voltages has that, that effective value you see it's multiplied by root 2 to make this the peak value of the voltage and has a phase shift of 23.68 degrees and that is way simpler of course. Graphically we could have done that too and that is the way it used to be done years ago. If you've seen movies like Encounters of the Third Kind you see that engineers were actually adding phasers graphically on a big blackboard at the power plant. We don't do that anymore graphically, yeah, but it's a good a good visualization scheme. Well, if we're going to represent voltages and currents with complex phasers, what's going to happen to resistors and inductors and capacitors? Well, if we do that in the phasor domain, of course, we have been shown that multiplying by j omega in the phasor domain is equivalent to finding the derivative in the time domain. And we were shown also in second year that dividing by j omega is equivalent to integrating in the time domain. In short, this differential equation of the inductor V is L D I D T in the phasor domain is written as phasor of V is J omega L times phasor of I. This is the way we have translated the derivative from the time domain to the phasor domain. And then dividing by J omega is equivalent to integrating in the phasor domain. All right. Then this integral equation in the capacitor of the voltage is 1 over C, the integral of the current over time. That becomes that the phasor of the voltage V with a hat, it's a complex number, is equal to the phasor of the current divided by J omega C. All right. Well, uh, let's see. In a resistor, the phasor of the voltage is R times the phasor of the current. In an inductor, the phasor of the voltage is J omega L, the phasor of the current we have seen. And in the capacitor, the phasor of the voltage is the phasor of the current divided by J omega C, but that is the same as negative J, 1 over omega C times I. You do the math. Hmm. In either case, V is something times I. Well, let's call R the impedance of the resistor, and let's call J omega L the impedance Z of the inductor, and let's call negative J1 over omega C the impedance of the capacitor Z sub C with a hat. If we do that, we can say that in any element, the voltage phasor is the impedance Z times the current phasor. Z is the impedance in ohms of each one of those elements and we have that again as the generalized Ohm's law. Impedances are measured in Ohm's and are given by those formulas. Who is Omega by the way? Omega is the angular frequency in radians per second of voltages and currents in the network. Of course. Now we can use modified nodal analysis and modified loop analysis again because now we have KVL, we have KCL and Ohm's law in the phasor and domain. So we can solve any network the same way we used to do with DC circuits. We represent elements by their impedances. We represent all voltages and all currents by phasors and then we apply the same methods of solutions.